So who in their right mind decides to sit down and talk about reissue chronographs? How much time do you have? This is going to be a big video, and this is prior to even starting the recording. All I can say is kick back, get something nice to drink, and enjoy, because we are going to be looking at some gorgeous watches, at least 30 of them. The first part of the series looked at reissue dive watches, and that was quite successful. A few suggestions then said have a look at chronographs, and after a bit of deliberation decided, well, it's a great idea, but a mouthful. We're going to be enjoying everything from entry level to high-end horology, with an aim to appreciate what made these vintage pieces so special, and just why reissue chronographs are very exciting in this space. To begin, we can address the reissue question. One side we could say, well, many of these companies are kind of creatively bankrupt and are enjoying looking back at their past pieces for inspiration. We could also say that due to the high demand of vintage pieces, this is a much more accessible way to get into this realm without overspending. It's a niche and a genre all to itself. But it's also hard to escape that some of these pieces were just designed and inspired, built better back then. Owing to the fact that many of these companies were competing against one another for not only sales but for contract deals. Pushing the boundaries of what was possible at the time because technology was ever evolving. And as industries began to expand, so the watches needed to meet certain requirements. When we looked at the area of reissue dive watches, we noticed that they were commonly made either for military forces or for the casual, everyday user. With chronographs, we see a bit of a different take. Most of them are either made for the amateur professional racing driver or for the military, given primarily to aviators and pilots. So just bear in mind as we look through these pieces that most of them were given to either pilots or racing drivers when they were made. I've had to create separate groups just to make them a bit more digestible for all of us. Also note that odds are I haven't selected all of the pieces that you might know and many might not be mentioned in this video but the selection is still great. Let's enjoy it. In no particular order let's begin with Omega. All of us have a soft spot for the Speedmaster somewhere. From left to right the Omega wrist chronograph 18 CHRO. The Speedmaster first Omega in space. The Speedmaster 1957 reissue the Speedmaster Ed White, and the Speedmaster Mark II. These aren't chronologically correct, and the arrangement was mainly just to keep the leather on one side and the stainless steel on the other. You have to be pedantic somewhere. So we begin with the CHRO. This is the first ever wrist chronograph ever made by the family. If I'm not wrong, 1918. And it goes by the street name of the Lawrence of Arabia Omega, because he did in fact wear this watch. Made a whole video about T.E. Lawrence and his story, so I'll link that in the corner of the screen. But it's just exceptional. It's a beautiful watch, and has to be one of the best reissues that the brand has ever done before, just because of the level of detail put into it. Everything, from the presentation to the movement finishing, it's perfectly accurate to the original. It is the oldest looking chronograph that we will be seeing, and this piece was specifically made for pilots back in the day when planes actually first took to sky and combat, but it's everything. It captures the time period, looking at the numerals on the dial, the arrangement of the subdials, the use of different colors, heat bluing, the rose gold used on the pusher and the crown, how the strap has been attached to those welded lugs. It's fascinating. This piece exhibits a great story of design and development that went into its DNA. And from it, the most successful chronographs ever produced by the brand, the Speedmaster. We can begin by looking at the first Speedmaster being the 1957 reissue, also known as the CK2915. And it's another watch that in the line is so unique because it is not only the first. Imagine if other brands like its chief competitor bringing out a reissue of its first chronograph, how popular it would be. A lot of development went into recreating this piece to the T, but it just doesn't look like a Speedmaster. And this could appeal to a lot of people. You're dealing with a watch here that has a smaller case size. It doesn't have an aluminium bezel insert, a broad arrow hour hand, an interesting use of scale and proportions. And what it allows you to do is appreciate the prototype phase of development. Sure, not everything works. It's not supposed to. But you get to see and enjoy that original foundation, that core DNA that began the trend. And that's inspiring. Next to it, we see the first Omega in space. And this one is highly sought after in the community. 
because it bridges the gap between the professional that we know and the 57 reissue. Many of the elements that we now know on the watch is present and clear. No, you don't have a professional case yet, but the dial, the bezel, the layout, all looks very familiar. Distinguishing factors, you have an applied Omega logo, you have gorgeous alpha styled hands. And even here we see a watch that doesn't look like a professional instrument just yet. It still has dressy elements to it, which does tone down the overall look and keeps it relevant to its time. Then we move to the Ed White reissue. This being one of the most significant Omega Speedmasters ever made. The fact that they have reproduced this watch, stainless steel, all the bells and whistles, including a full recreation of the 321 caliber. It's impressive. Has to be one of the most faithful recreations that we will be seeing in this lineup. Lots of watches will keep the aesthetic, but not go so far to recreate the movement as well. But this piece does it, and has all the hallmarks that we know, like pencil styled hands. Making it an Ed White means that you still have the non-professional case, you still have the applied Omega logo, lots of little quirks and unique aspects that would probably appeal to the collector and the real enthusiast. But since we are talking about reissue chronographs, not much comes close to this watch in this category. And then finally we look at the Speedmaster Mark II Racing Edition. The Mark II was never seen as a popular watch in this space. Its design is definitely polarizing. But if you want something that highlights the, the late 60s to early 70s transition across, where you start seeing that rounded off integrated cushion case, how the bezel has been recessed into the dial, it's not as timeless as the pieces that we have looked at already, but it is exciting in a different way. It lets you appreciate details like the orange accents on the dial, how virtually everything is loomed, and as a piece that shows the gradual progression away from the first professional models, this one sits right in that transitional zone as well. Moving away from Omega into Zenith, we see a group of four watches in the presentation. From left to right, the El Primero A384, the A386, the G381, and the A3818. Very much like the Speedmasters that we've just looked at, these are so enigmatic of the Zenith name and brand. And as far as modern reissues go, these are some of the best. Where the Omegas were made for racing, and eventually space, these were made purely for racing. The El Primero, we know as the first automatic column wheel chronograph, the movements are spectacular, and then we look at the designs of these pieces. The A384, not only are you getting a panda aesthetic here, but it is so unique, and it's everything. The case size, the proportions on the wrist, the way the hard edges work and pair up next to the circular form of the dial. How so much attention has been put into where the subdials are placed and their relevancy when you look at their sizes. The use of red as the primary accent on the chronograph hand. When you really want to get particular, you can also get this watch with an original Gay Frere bracelet. When it comes to reinvigorating a style, instead of the typical tricolor El Primeros that we know so well, bringing this out, the first El Primero, it's a watch that would suit any collection, which is why it's the primary watch on the cover photo for this video. Another thing that makes this watch great is the fact that it is not trying to shout for your attention. With its small stature, vintage size, it has a presence all of its own. Then we move to the A386, which was the next step forward, where we started seeing the tricolor dial. And this is what the stereotypical El Primero became afterwards. But like the A384, everything has been repeated and created correctly here. Such an excellent presence. The use of contrast and line weight on the dial is what makes an effective chronograph, and this has it in spades. One of the most highly sought after pieces in this line is the G381. And if you want a gold chronograph with a panda aesthetic, not many come close to this. Probably one of the most highly sought after in this price point, but just look at it. The contrast between colors, the use of black and gold is always complementary, offset then by white highlights. Also notice how the subdials have been arranged and so well balanced to allow for all the batons to fit the dial and for it to just look correct. And then we move to a fairly recent release known as the CoverGirl, the A3818, made in partnership with Revolution and the Rake. Another watch that pays direct tribute to a very specific model in the El Primero line, using the same format of the A384 case, but this with a striking blue dial and the offset colors used on the subdials. Next to the Golden Gate Bridge inspired minute track, it's crazy, it's unique, it's period correct, and feels much more like a watch of its time next to the others that we've seen. But as far as original El Primeros go, 
you can't get better than this selection. Next, we're moving to a set of Seikos, the Rider's Chronograph, the Pogue, and the Ripley, also commonly known as the Jujaro. These three pieces represent their time periods very accurately, we could say. Looking at the colors, the highlights, the design aesthetics chosen, they aren't necessarily timeless, they are very fitting to their time period. The Racing Chronograph, also designed by Jujaro, specifically for motorcyclists, the dial being tilted at an angle, allowed the rider to read the time and the chronograph without having to shift their wrist as they were holding the handlebars. There's a great use of contrasting colors here, which is something very evident that we see with all Jujaro designs. Gray being the primary color and orange being the secondary. Complementary and easy to read at a glance. The case form and bracelet is also very unique, and we see that this styling is starting to make a resurgence now looking at brands like H. Moser and C with the Streamliner. It almost has a lobster tail aesthetic. Then we move to the Pogue, one of the first Seikos that went into space. And it's a watch that could be recognized from 100 meters away. The orange dial is quite the giveaway. Everything about its format screams the 70s. And it's a watch that does deserve its own separate video, which will be done very soon. And then we move to the most recognizable, the Jujara or the Ripley being worn famously in Aliens. Visually, it looks like a watch that can do a lot more. Its presentation says it has more auxiliary features behind it, but actually it's just a chronograph with a date complication. But here we see how the use of Bauhaus seemed to inspire the way the case and the bracelet was formed. Rigid and up-down, very German in the way that the metal was finished, an almost gunmetal surface. Squares, circles and rectangles being the primary shapes incorporated all the way through the design of the watch. And of the three in the group that we've seen, this one doesn't seem to be as dated as the others. Mainly because the simple, rigid shapes allow for this design to transcend further along in the timeline and allows it to be less polarizing, less recognizable as a design of the time it was made. Now this selection had to be done. Longines and Breitling, side by side. All of these pieces were created for aviators. You can see that they share common themes, just approached differently. From left to right, we have the Longines Aviation Watch, A7, 1935. The Longines Big Eye. The Breitling AVI, 765, 1953. And finally, the Breitling 806 from 1959. Longines has had a good track record when recreating these pieces far before many other brands decided to pick up and try the same. The 1935 AVI, peculiar looking piece, a watch of its time, being offset, again, allowing for the reader to use it without having to shift wrist position. You see nuances like Breguet styled hands, the subdials being arranged at the 12 and at the 6 o'clock position. Vintage inspired classic numerals. The most rakish element is the offset pusher at the 1 o'clock position. Very stylish. A mono pusher chronograph is no small feat. And it was a technology that was revered and famous back in the day. A great looking model. But the watch in this line that is not only accessible, but is so unique in its presentation, is the Longines Big Eye. And this watch has been compared next to the 765, which we will be looking at in a moment. The similarities shared between these two watches is something else. Whether it's legibility, the use of the chronograph, and how those subdials have been arranged so differently, sizes, line weights, are all unique to the specific function. It's visually complex, but also complete in the way it presents itself and is probably one of the most successful recreations that Longines has ever made. Next to that, we look at the Breitling pieces, the 765 AVI from 1953. And in a moment, we will be looking at watches that very much inspired these pieces. But you see the same hallmarks in places, the way that the subdial on the right-hand side at the three o'clock has loom applied to it, just like the Longines Big Eye. Visually, the watch looks a bit more dated because it uses syringe-style hands, and the typeface isn't as modern. But what it has and understands is a great use of proportion and balance between all of the parts. Also note that it has a rotating bezel, making it practical for other applications. And then we move to the 1959-806 Navi Timer. This also being a very recent production. It's overly complicated, it's technical, but that is what the Navi Timer has always been about. Seeing these two watches as a pairing shows you that Breitling is investing a lot of their energy into these recreations. A great looking set of pieces all around, vintage inspired, mostly from the 50s. Then we move to Hoyer and Bulliver. There are many in this line, too many to show. From left to right, we have the Hoyer Ortavia, 85th anniversary Jack Hoyer. We then have the Hoyer Monaco, a limited edition Hoyer Monza, and the outlier, 
the Bulova Deep Sea Chronograph. These pieces saw their time in the 60s and 70s, and were some of the most famous during that time period. The Ottavia, a pure racing driver's watch. This model made to commemorate Jack Hoyer. With its silver panda aesthetic, its striking, a rotating bezel. The history behind this watch, it was supplied to so many racing drivers, next to the Carrera and many others. But this watch was on the wrist of many race winners back in the day. Hoyer as a brand understood contrast and legibility of racing chronographs better than most, which is why they were so successful. Not only were the movements fantastic, but the layouts were so easy to understand that the professional or the amateur could use this watch on the track from the sidelines as a functional instrument. Next to the Ottavia, we have the Monaco, the watch that famously had the Caliber 11 movement inside it that competed directly against the Zenith El Primero. The A384 and the Monaco were released virtually at the same time, both being some of the world's first automatic chronographs. This watch worn by Steve McQueen in Le Mans has an excellent amount of presence. The TV case style, I mean, this watch has been spoken about so much before. But we look at the use of colors, white, blue, and red. It speaks so true to the time period when it was created, and that's probably why it's been able to stand the test of time so well. The elements that constantly fascinate me about this watch is the use of squares, and how the squares are incorporated into circles. How the batons around the dial have been arranged horizontally to fill out that negative space. We could say there was no rhyme or reason to the design of this watch, but that's part of the fun. We must remember that producing this watch was a race to the finish, quite literally. Not only to promote the new movement, but to just get something out there before its competitors. And then we look at the Monza. This being a special edition with, if I'm not mistaken, a PVD coated titanium case. This model in particular has won a few watchmaking awards, but as we see it next to the Monaco, it is the direct transcendent. And you notice how parts have been tightened up, how areas have been looked at in a lot more detail, how the case and lugs work a lot better. There is a greater form around the piece. The presence is there. It's also a lot more legible. Not only can you determine the time easily, but you can also use the chronograph at a glance. And that is ultimately what makes this such a good instrument. Then we move to the Bulova Deep Sea Chronograph with the surfboard subdials. This being a piece that was recently brought out and screams of the era when it was made. Whether we're looking at the orange highlights on the hands, the Pepsi inspired bezel, the cream dial, the cushion style case that was so popular during the 60s and the 70s, even to the bracelet. The word quirky comes to mind when you look at its overall presentation. After observing the Longines and the Breitlings, pilot chronographs, the ones that we're looking at now hold the core DNA of the original pilot watches of the 50s. Most Swiss and French brands actually borrowed German-inspired layouts for their dials. From left to right, the Breguet Type 20, the Hanhart 417, the Guinand 361, and the Zinn 158. The Breguet Type 20 is the most attainable chronograph you can get in the line, you notice how similar its aesthetic is next to the Longines and the Breitlings we've seen already. That's primarily because all of the inspirations were directly linked to Hanhart, which we will look at in a moment. But when you want a watch that has Breguet on the dial, those gorgeous numerals, such a clean understanding of symmetry, how again we notice the subdials are differently arranged relative to their function. It makes for a complete watch that could easily serve its purpose for being an instrument as well as something more formal for dress occasions. And from Breguet, this is one of a few watches in their line that actually looks like a tool watch. Next to it, we have the Hanhart 417, this being made in partnership with the Rake and Revolution again. If I'm not mistaken, this being worn by Steve McQueen as one of his personal watches. Hanhart as a brand is one of the most famous influences in the pilot chronograph segment. This watch and this family deserves a video by itself, its DNA, along with a few others, is the reason for the Breguet Type 20 that we've just seen, the Longines Big Eye and those Breitling chronographs. It's a very important watch, and it's great to see it gets the recognition it deserves. It's not the most modern looking watch by today's standards, definitely looks like a piece out of the Second World War, early 50s. Very rudimentary details like a fluted bezel that can turn with a red highlight at the top, but that completeness that we've been speaking about, looking at those early aviator chronographs, came from this watch. That's all you need to know. Then we look at the Guinand 361, another famous aviator chronograph. This one looking to be a piece more inspired by the 60s, and you can tell by the numeral placement and the bezel layout. An excellent use of contrast that you notice around the minute track and all of the points on the tachymeter. Then we move to the Zinn 158 Bundeswehr, 
There are many other watches that could have been included in this category, like the Navitimer. Technically, Hoya was the brand that held the 3H Bundeswehr aesthetic. But also including Zinn in this lineup had to be done, since we are predominantly looking at German pieces in this group. It's the legibility, it's the contrast, the line weights, something that German watches seem to do so well and understand better than most. It looks like an instrument. And those red highlights we see on the dial are there for a purpose, indicating the chronograph hand and the running 30 minute totalizer. All of these watches hold this 50s to 60s transitional style. Makes for a nice pairing. Some of my favorites in the reissue category. The Jeje Le Coutre Deep Sea Chronograph and the Blancpain Air Command. All of these watches are hard to find. They are very unique, true to their brands, and are highly sought after. You notice that there are two JLCs in the group. Frankly, I couldn't decide which to use, so chose both. The one on the left, the more traditional, period correct style. The one on the right, the more modern, transitional approach. And you see how these watches share a similar relationship amongst themselves. One of the most unique and interesting features with the JLC is, is that it has a color swatch that allows you to know whether or not the chronograph is moving and whether or not you can use the pushes while you're in the water. The colors are a simple indicator to tell you that the chronograph is working at a glance. And the key word we could use to sum up the deep sea chronograph is balance. There is so much symmetry shared between the aggressive indices, the syringe styled hands, the placement of the numerals around the subdials and how they rotate in a circular fashion. Yes, it's very dated, but practical. Then we look at the Blancpain Air Command, an aesthetic that we now know very well. We've seen it used on Longines, Breitling, Hanhart, Breguet. You notice how this cross-pollination worked back then. If the approach was effective, everyone should use it. But here we see a piece that not only celebrates simplicity with its simple forms around the dial, but also complexity in the way that it uses its lines. Here we see a piece that is almost a culmination of those old elements. The classic numeral arrangement. The early 50s, we could say late 40s inspired tachymeter that runs around the dial. It does look to be a watch of its time, but we should also bear in mind that it's a flyback chronograph. The proportions and presence of this watch is top notch, with all of the modern componentry that you would ever want. It takes the Type 20 aesthetic and pushes it into another realm. Now we're looking at a more budget friendly segment. From left to right, the Mont Blanc 1858 automatic chronograph, the Longines Classic 1946, the Longines Heritage Diver chronograph, and the Tissot Heritage 1973. The Mont Blanc chronograph is quite special. It's inspired by an 1858 dial layout. So we can assume that this was a dial that would have been used in pocket watches. And do you see how this DNA was translated into the pieces that we would later know in the 40s and the 50s? It visually seems like a model that lines up with all of the other pilot chronographs we've seen so far. The aspects that date it, the cathedral styled hands, and the rail dials that circle the totalizers. But the typeface is fairly modern, the size and scale of the watch doesn't date it very much, and the balance on the dial is also something to commend. Mont Blanc is approaching their designs very well, and it's a brand that should be looked into more. The Longines Classic 1946, here we see Breguet numerals, the typical heat blued hands of the time, and this being a watch that looks like it captures that post-war period so well. You can see how easily this piece would have worked on the wrist of a pilot, or on the wrist of an officer, and the aspect that is inspiring about these designs is that even though the world was going through so much turmoil back then, they could still create some of the most beautiful functional instruments, and that is captured well here. The Longines Heritage Diver Chronograph. Here we have a compressor chronograph, meaning that you can rotate the bezel with the outside crown, and immediately, on close inspection, you start thinking about the Hoya Monza that we saw earlier. The colors used, the symmetry, the balance, the cushion case, screams the late 60s and the 70s. And next to it, we see the Tissot Heritage 1973, newly released pieces in their line that capture those motifs all over again. Panda aesthetic, racing strap, the rounded cushion case, all of the lines, highlights, contrasting elements that work so well together. And to determine whether or not it's a good chronograph, can you read the hour and minute hand easily? You can. Can you read the chronograph easily? Yes, you can. Both of these 70s watches look pretty dated. They do look like pieces from their time. But that is the joy of reissue chronographs. Some age better than others. And in this segment, you cannot ignore the Hamilton Intramatic. Panda and reversed Panda dials. These two watches have served as inspiration for so many others. We see how micro brands are using this aesthetic directly. 
and it's purely down to how well the contrast works, how it makes for easy legibility, ease of use when running the chronograph and reading the time. The case with vertical lugs makes the wearing experience a lot better for smaller wrists. The watch's presence is brought down because of this. And these pieces aren't only unique and accessible, but are striking and celebrates the essence of what makes the Panda aesthetic so appealing. And finally, looking at the Horterology, we've seen all the names, but not the big three, Patek Philippe, Audemars Piguet, and Vacheron Constantin. So from left to right, the Patek Philippe 5172G, the Audemars Piguet Remaster 1 chronograph, and the Vacheron Constantin Historique Corne de Vache. What a grouping. The Patek has this 40s inspired aesthetic to it. I don't know whether or not it is directly inspired by a certain watch in its line, but we see that relationship between the numerals, subdials, handset, how that then translates to the lugs, which very much dates this watch. You can celebrate all of those cues that makes this piece look like a classic aviator's instrument. To the Audemars Piguet remaster, a painstaking recreation of a classic and we can see immediately that this watch is dated in its appearance. The teardrop lugs, the subdials, the use of lines and this deco format, even the colors chosen. But it is so unique and fits into this reissue category well. I'm sure for this modern age it has been scaled up in size, but it shows you clearly how watch design evolved from here to the 40s, 50s and onwards. And then finally, the corn de vache, one of the most unique and instantly recognizable chronographs out there. The lugs literally being inspired by the horns of a cow. They also have this scarab aesthetic to them. Very dated in its appearance, but is just beautiful. All three of these watches are very difficult to find. This one is no exception. These pieces all have different arrangements of metals and finishes, brushing and polishing. But what makes this watch feel all the more unique? Yes, the lugs and the arrangement is something. But at the time, we see that there was a great attention to styling above function. This resurgence of deco inspirations that was used so clearly. Reissue chronographs come in all shapes and sizes, from different eras, for different applications and purposes. And from this, hopefully, you can see why they are so interesting. Because you get a clearer understanding about what made them unique at the time, what the styles were, if they in fact served their function and their purpose. Were their competitors better? Ultimately, they are a group of watches that you can get and appreciate for their obscurity. Looking at how certain aspects were approached back then would probably make you laugh, but also make you think and possibly understand why they didn't choose this direction moving forward. The deeper understanding of aesthetics and how they are relevant to their respective times. And this is what adds an extra dynamic to our love for watches, appreciation of their history and how their designs paved the way forward.